So one thing people encounter when they go to a Thai monastery is most of the libraries have a book of a bunch of pictures of dead bodies. And uh, one of my favorite Buddhist love stories is a man I knew, a practitioner, who was staying at the monastery where I ordained and met a woman there. And she said, where are you going? And he said, well, I'm going up to the library to look at pictures of dead bodies. And she said, how dead are they? And he said, pretty dead. And they went up and looked at the pictures of dead bodies together and fell in love. <laughs> he later ordained as a monk, so it didn't totally have a long-term trajectory in the Romantic era or area. But well, it's a mysterious path. So. <laughs> And now and again, it's nice and I think very important to speak as a monk, a monk to the least popular of the Buddhist topics in Western, especially secular Buddhism. Perhaps chief among these is body contemplation or asubha practice. Asubha means not beautiful. A not suba beautiful, not beautiful. The first monastery I went to in Thailand was Wat Pananachat, where the Western disciples of Ajahn Chah began a community with English as the basic language for Westerners hoping to ordain. And there's a funeral pyre there. And the first week I stayed, there was a funeral. And where in the West, we have a ritual of dressing a body up, pumping it full of chemicals so it won't decay, putting makeup on it, and letting people glimpse it for just a second before you shut it away. In Thailand, I think the relationship to the body is much healthier. Although often now the bodies are in line with what's done in the West, kept largely out of sight before being cremated, there's still a thread of tradition, especially at monasteries, which were built around cremation grounds, where there's an open funeral pyre, and the body is wrapped in white cloth, laid on top of wood, and burnt. And everyone watches the body go. So the first week I was at Wat Pananachat, there was a cremation, and watching as the flames rose and consumed this frame of the body, seeing the fat burn off, seeing form dissolve into smoke and light, and just seeing truth of the body was so grounding. When we speak about body contemplation are not beautiful, looking at the body as it is. Often people have a reaction of saying, I don't want, I just want to see the body, you know, as this thing it is. I don't want to sort of look in this morbid way at it. I think that really misses the point. Truth becomes clearer the closer you look at something. And the fact that if you point people to just look a little bit closer at the body, to look just, just under the skin, to look at what happens if they don't wash the body for a few days. The fact that this initiates such a strong reaction, I think should be a hint to us all that there's something we're not seeing. The Buddhist practice of looking at the body as it is, is not morbid. It's just seeing it clearly. It's just looking at something a bit deeper than skin deep. And there's immense benefit. In our culture, there's a bunch of narratives about our delusion around death. We understand that we 
have a delusion around our mortality and that if we saw clearly the fact that we would die, we would change a lot in, in our lives. We would give up many of our grudges. We would take the trip we've been waiting to take. We would forgive the people that we can't forgive. And pop culture is full of narratives and movies about people understanding their mortality and suddenly bringing their lives in line with their deeper values. Our delusion about the body is so deep that we don't realize it's there. It's one of the most interesting moments and pivot points in practice is when people suddenly understand that they aren't seeing the body clearly, that there's a level of attachment to it which is profoundly deeply rooted and which we just don't see. And it has deep effect. The constant drive in our culture to inflame sexual desire especially in an era where pornography and other things are really common, is an enormous current. And it leaves many of us helpless, not just in relationship, in terms of how do we make sure that our sexual desire is not drawing us outside of the bounds of an ethical relationship with a significant other, but much deeper with how do we interact with people in our lives who are attractive or maybe unattractive. E either is difficult and look at them as people, not as their body. It's a profound gift to be able to interact with someone and have them not be a looked at chiefly as an attractive form or an unattractive form, but just as their chitta, as their heart. And this is the gift of body contemplation, is it lets you step back and you don't look at people as old or young or attractive or unattractive or this or that race. It's just a body and the heart is more visible and more visible. Similarly, if one develops body contemplation, it gives you a tool to soften and cool down lust, which is really useful. If you're looking at a coworker or a friend uh, who Maybe you're in a relationship and it's not appropriate to inflame this lust. And just having a tool where you can bring to bear contemplation and just cool the fire a bit is a good thing. And finally, so many of our defilements, our greed, hatred, and delusion are round, wound deeply into the body. And we appreciate these high-minded Zen contemplations like what was my face before I was born, these deep koans, which sound so... Uh, profound. But what body contemplation does is it tears apart the sense of unwholesome self in this nitty gritty way that's deeply powerful. And it's not as romantic. You're looking at your spleen. It's much more kind of attractive to, to talk about loving kindness. But if you really can see through the body a bit, all the defilements are hamstrung. And time and again in the suttas, and this is why this is the great teaching that the West has left behind. So many of the breakthroughs of senior monks and nuns are based on them breaking through the body, that khanda, that focus of identity of the body. Breaking through it is often paramount to the first glimpse of enlightenment. It's that powerful. So this is not a small thing. It's not a fringe practice. And additionally, if you're on retreat for a long period, you might find that you can't do samatha, tranquility practice, anymore. It's like the glass is full, and returning to the breath or a mantra just feels like slamming your head against a wall. It's the mind doesn't want any more samadhi practice. And often what it needs and wants is body contemplation. That's insight. It's using that powerful mind and pouring its energy into insight because the mind that's powerful can see clearly. And if you know and have access to this practice of body contemplation in those moments of retreat or deep meditation where the mind has become calm and rested, and then as it begins to move again, you begin to contemplate the body, you can find that 
it feels profoundly interesting and it's actually the correct route for your practice. And then when you return to samadhi practice later, samatha, tranquility, the mind is ready and interested. And this is the back and forth of samatha and vipassana, tranquility and insight practice that steadily deepens. But without this body contemplation, so many in the West are left with just one foot. You're hopping on just samatha and you don't have vipassana. So it's useful to have this tool, even though it's really unpopular to talk about. So the, the Buddha spoke about several means of body contemplation. The first was the 32 parts. And he says that just as a farmer might sort through a bag of beans and rice, saying, this is mung beans, these are coarse-grained rice, this is fine-grained rice. Even so, a practitioner contemplates from the soles of the feet to the crown of the head, the body is filled with this many unclean things, and then goes through the list, hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, bones, bone marrow, uh, pus, blood, etc., all the fun stuff. And those five external objects of uh, hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin, the wrapping of the body, those are the first objects given to monastics when they ordain, even before a breath meditation object. So they're very powerful. And how one works with body contemplation is usually you try to make the mind calm first and let it rest in samadhi for a time. But after that, it might begin to move, and not in a way that's distracted or feels like defiled, but rather it's just energized. And this is when you bring to mind body contemplation. If you're an aversive type character with a lot of uh, aversion, then you have to be especially careful with this. But if you're a greed type, where your primary defilement is greed, um, you can kind of know if you walk into a room, do you first notice the things you like or do you first notice the things that you really don't like? And if you're an aversive type, then be careful with body contemplation. And if you find you're doing this and then two days later you wake up really grumpy like a bear, like just waking up from hibernation, it might be good to just develop loving kindness or breath meditation. But if you find that you do lean towards greed and that this body contemplation brings the sense of coolness, then it's a safe contemplation and it can be a really powerful aspect of your practice. So when the mind has rested in this calm and begins to move again, then you go through the different parts of the body. So there's a list online if you type in 32 parts of the body or look in the chanting book, it's there. You just go through the list and find one that interests you, that feels really interesting. The mind that's powerful, the mind that is calm has power to see clearly. And if your mind is coming from that place of calm, it'll have an afterglow of power to it. And it'll, as you go through that list, you'll find something that is genuinely interesting. It's like the mind is attracted to it. And take that as a sign that it's worth investigating. So how, what you do then is contemplate. And that's a vague term, but you kind of have to figure out your own way of contemplating. And as I talked about last Saturday, there are three kinds of practice the Buddha spoke about with regards to uh, activities internally. There's kaya sankara, body, bodily activity, citta sankara, which is mental activity, and wachi sankara, verbal activity. And bringing to mind all three can be helpful, or deciding which one's most useful. So kaya sankara is the feeling in the body. So say uh, one of the most powerful objects for most people is the bones. That's almost always a safe object that's gonna work. So if you just bring to mind bones, and you can feel the bone, feel the sense of your teeth against the other teeth, feel the 
a uh, sense of your kind of hip bones touching the earth, or just feel internally the bones in the arm or the vertebrae, that sense of internal feeling of the bone, that's kaya sankara, that's bodily activity, your feeling in the body. Vachi sankara, or verbal activity, is the words, it's verbalization. So that might be a phrase, like just saying bones, bones. Or you can contemplate bones, these aren't me, or it's just calcium. You could even just say that, it's just calcium. Or bones are not self. Or bones, stones, bones, stones. That's what I would do often, is imagining the vertebrae as a bunch of river stones, because they're no different. The internal calcium of the, of the skeleton and the external minerals in a stone are no different, uh, one way or the other. Um, so using those verbal phrases and finding one that kind of hits the spot, that's vachi sankara. Or chitta sankara, that's a perception or an image. So that can be almost a, a movie in your head. You can either just imagine the bones and it, imagine the skeleton, or you can actually imagine, say, the bones crumbling into dust and disappearing into the earth. Or you can imagine your vertebrae as a bunch of river stones. Or you can really contemplate the fact that this earth, almost every piece of earth or solid element we touch is, has been a bone of an animal through these many millennia. The earth is just a bunch of bone, and our bone is just a bunch of earth. So these are kind of the ways of using kaya sankara, the internal sense of the body, vachi sankara, uh, meant, or verbal fabrication, so using a phrase, or chitta sankara, an image or a kind of recollection to contemplate. And you'll find one phrase or one image that really feels interesting, and the mind grabs onto it with that powerful attention. And if it leads to the sense of coolness, then just let yourself cycle through it until it loses its power. And then you can either bring to mind a different one, or you can return to your samatha object. And this will deepen, deepen concentration. Other very powerful objects tend to be the blood. Um, and just imagining the blood, it's just liquid, it's just like water. Um, and you can even do that blood, water, blood, water. And how, as the body decays, it fades into the rivers. It fades into the rainwater. All the rainwater has been blood before, probably, of other animals over these many millennia. Similarly, all of our water in our bodies has been in the ocean. It's been water in other beings' uh, bodies. Even just recently, we exchange out all the material in our bodies regularly. So whatever form you have right now, it's different than you were when you were a child, and it's probably formed of these other elements. The skin is very useful. You can contemplate um, what happens if you don't wash the body. Within a few days, it starts to smell. It gets oily. It gets the clothes dirty. Uh, and just contemplate that. This body is constantly oozing oil. You can contemplate the fact that, um, you know, and like what happens to your hair if you don't wash it for a week? How does it smell? What is that? Uh, you can contemplate the fact that everything you see about another person's body is dead. Um, if the f skin was alive on the surface, it would be unbelievably painful. So even the surface level of the skin is actually dead flesh. The eyes look alive, but that's just because they're moist. So th there's a reason that people don't usually teach this, because as you can see, it's like pretty intense. But if the mind is calm, having this ability to see the body just a little more clearly is really useful. And over time, it leads to your fear of death being let go of because you're less attached to the body. And we really are attached to the body. I think one of the biggest indicators of this for me is when you're sitting in meditation and you get bit by a mosquito, which happens a lot in Thailand. And the mosquito bite's not that bad, but there's this really sense of like, how dare, how dare that mosquito bite me? And there's this sense of violation. And just to see that our sense of self kind of extends around the body, and the mosquito bite's not bad, but there's this sense of violation. Or similarly, this delusion where what happens if you find a hair in your soup, even if it's your own hair? It's like, or what if you spit into your soup? Like, disgusting, right? 
it's your spit, it's in your mouth. So what, what are we not seeing there? Why there's delusion at work and just acknowledging that. And if we can find a way to contemplate just a little bit, it really is helpful, even though it's not that romantic to talk about. You can also just recollect the body doesn't obey us. There's, if you're sick, the body doesn't ask to be sick. If the body, it just does its own thing. It ages on its own accord. Sometimes you're ill enough that even if you tell the body to stand, it won't. If you tell it to run, it won't. This body is not ours. We don't own it. We're borrowing it. And there was a disciple of Tan Por Lee who was challenged by a person in his life who said, okay, why can't I just hit you? If this body's not you, what's the problem? And Tan Por Lee said, look, tell them that you're borrowing this body and you gotta take good care of it. You have to take care of what you're borrowing. So we acknowledge the limits of this body, but we also acknowledge that it's a gift to have this. The, the body's a profoundly useful tool of practice and it's our vehicle to liberation. In the book, in the Samyutta Nikaya, the Connected Discourses on the Unconditioned, the first sutta is about the body. The Buddha says, what is the deathless? What is the unconditioned? The cessation of greed, hatred, and delusion. What is the root to the unconditioned? Contemplation of the body. And he says that even as the ocean holds all rivers that flow into it, even so, all states there are that partake of true knowledge are contained within mindfulness of the body. So this body, this death-bound, most fragile of things, is also the route to liberation. And we treat it like a good friend. We take care of it, but we acknowledge it's just doing its best. And contemplating it clearly lets us see that and not expect more of it than it can give. And when it gets sick and paralyzed, we, the heart doesn't break along with it. This is our, us preparing for death or preparing for illness. The next contemplation the Buddha gave was the elements. And this can be a much more delicate access point for people who can be a, put, a bit put off by that contemplation of the 32 parts, which is just seeing the body as the different, uh, composed of these different elements of earth, fire, air, water. And it doesn't have to be this kind of medieval categorization, but rather just seeing that this is how the mind can kind of divide it up, its solidity, its liquidity, its movement, which is air and its heat. And if you can just see, honestly, the most powerful way I find to work with this is imagining giving the body back, watching it dissolve, and give back the earth element into the earth, and imagine and understand that this earth in the body is no different than the earth outside the body. It's no different than the earth of the people around you, the solidity. And if the mind is calm, there really can be these profound insights that come from that, where you wake up and you realize that your body and the bed and everything around you, it's just earth and liquid. And there's no real distinction between the body and the bed. And there's no real distinction between you and the person across from you. And you begin to realize how much of our othering and our hatred and our greed are all predicated on these deeply rooted perceptions of self and other and me and mine and you and yours. And if it's just earth, it hamstrings it all. So you can use those three forms of contemplation of bodily, verbal, and mental to contemplate earth and water as well in the body. You can just say, okay, these bones are just earth and then imagine them fading into the earth. Imagine how they're the same as the stones around you. They're no different. Or imagine how the blood and the liquidity is just the ocean. It's the same thing, it's the rainwater. And imagine it dissolving back into that. And that's also useful just if you find in your meditation you're feeling a bit heavy, then maybe you have a bit too much earth element in your recollection. So bring to mind water or wind. Just say that, water, water, and watch that kind of liquidity lighten the meditation 
Or if you find you feel really ungrounded and airy, restless, bring to mind earth and watch yourself ground. And the third contemplation is that of the charnel ground. And this is the watching the body in various states of decomposition. And it's sort of what we did with the beginning meditation of imagining the body fading. And I find if that's held correctly, it can really just be seen as this giving back the body, preparing for what is to come, and recollecting that this form we have temporarily is just a mantle of clay that will dissolve back. And when you see that, you prepare for when the body begins to go that way. I remember being in a hospital in Ubon in Thailand, and the ward was full, and you could hear people moaning and yelling and screaming. You could s smell the scent of pus and bile, and you could sense this gigantic perception from so many people there of betrayal. It's as if all of their bodies had betrayed them at once because so few people prepare for this. And this is the beauty of looking at the body is that you're preparing for that moment when it's not doing what you want it to do, when it gets ill, when it reveals its nature. The Buddha said, who but out of mere foolishness would look at this body as healthy, even for a second? You know, on one level, we revel and appreciate the complexity of this magnificent form that lets us act, but we don't expect it to be more or more perfect than it is. And we use these tools to gain some distance from it and the ability to soften and cool lust, to see people's hearts below the veil of form, and to hamstring defilement that's wound into the khanda of rupa, the body. So I hope that didn't turn anyone off too much, uh, but I think it's important to talk about these tools every now and again, because the Buddha really held it up as a useful tool. Um, so good luck. Always wary about this talk, but it's kind of fun to give. So <laughs> um, we have a chance for questions, and I I think we have a mic we can hand to you. So feel free to raise hands if, we, if you want to discuss any topic or ask a question. Don't be shy. If you're on Zoom, feel free to raise your electronic hand as well. Hi. Hey. Um, my name is Brianna. Um, I have a question about, so often when we talk about body contemplation, um, we talk about neutralizing lust and attraction. And I guess I'm wondering um, sort of what the Theravada view is on other types of connection, love generally, that is not romantic, um, sort of karmic connections, things like that. How does that tie in to sort of beyond lust connection? Yeah, great question. This has come up twice before this in the past few days. People asking about where love fits in and, and how to hold people dear, but not in an unwholesome way. And it's hard because we don't have language for it in English, I think. The Buddha says that when one suffering arises from those we hold dear, and the word he uses is pia, those we hold dear. And for me, what that he's speaking to there is the sense of feeding and holding and attaching to another. And I think that's really important is the Buddhist word for attachment, upadana, it also is the term for fire feeding off of a fuel. And that sense of feeding off of people, that's really the problem. That's tanha, the source of, cra uh, of suffering, craving. And I think that metric of the key movement in practice is a switch from tanha and feeding off of those around us to chanda, chanda, which is desire rooted in, it's a different kind of desire. It's, it's, a, 
it's zeal, it's a wholesome desire to see things made whole, to give and to bless. So one of the key switches from, in Buddhist practice is the switch from an energy of feeding off of people and fire consuming fuel and agitated and hot to an ethic of blessing those around us and the energy of light, which is soft, cool, radiant, expansive, and non-agitated, but blesses those around it. So I'd say most of us are, a lot of our relationships are a nice hodgepodge of the two modes of caring. You know, we feed and depend and cling to people around us. But I think as we practice, you really begin to part, pick apart those two threads where you see, this is how I'm feeding off of this person and depending on them. And you don't always see it until it's compromised, until your loved one doesn't, you don't think, express as much love for you as you would like them to express. And then you see the attachment. Um, or maybe they aren't behaving like you wish they'd behave. Or maybe they've changed in a way you don't like or didn't expect. And then you see how much you're feeding off of them. And more and more as you practice, I think you begin to get a sense for this other form of love, which is beautiful. And it doesn't depend on you clinging, but it's liberative. So there's the love of feeding off of and controlling. And that's not wholesome. And it's not necessary. And then there's the love that's liberative love, which is really predicated on you having an internal source of happiness yourself and really blessing the people around you and, and giving them the freedom to be their own people, but loving them in the midst of that. And I think you really see that with spiritual friends in, in a community like this, which is like, I remember when I ordained, my parents are practitioners and I didn't miss them because I felt like we were walking parallel. And whenever we talked, and I feel this way about a lot of people in communities like this, it's like you meet and it's like you haven't even been away from each other. And you don't really, like the Dalai Lama probably doesn't miss people, you know, but it's not like you would be begrudge him that when he met you again. And um, so I think of that type, that distinction. It's love is a difficult term, but I think the term of feeding versus blessing is more relevant. And from a worldly perspective, it sounds monstrous to say like, I don't really miss people. But it's true. But it doesn't mean I love them less. It just means like there's a wider vision at work. And yeah, you just, I think practice is a steady movement of refining those relationships and moving more and more towards a liberating, blessing love rather than a feeding love that controls. Because you can't love something you're feeding off of, not completely. Um, and there's certain relationships that we have a special karmic duty to. So it's not like you don't, you know, you won't treat your kid the same way you treat someone on the street necessarily, you know, like there are karmic relationships to honor. So does that help at all? Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, Joseph. Thank you, Ajahn. Um, I was wondering. Can we turn it up a little bit? Just oh, saying, Joseph. Hello? Oh, that's a little Hi. better. Go for it. All right, so um, thank you, Anjan. I'm thinking about my, uh, mindfulness of the body in terms of uh, working towards being free from horror, humiliation, and disgust, you know, make your mind like earth, like we talked about. And I'm noticing when the mind is doing this contemplation, where where's the discomfort, what's arising? And it seems to be a feeling of the, the uncertainty of the time of death in terms of like, I might not get a chance to say thank you, or I might not get a chance to say I'm sorry to a person. I think it's resolving around separation, like you like you mentioned in terms of not missing people. Mm. And like, for example, like I might, like I'm trying not to be, I want to try to be mindful. Like what if I never get to say thank you to, what if this is the last time I see you, right? And like, I never get to say thank you to you in person, right? There's that feeling. There's that feeling of you could die at any minute. How do we work with that? You know what I mean? The the uncertainty of the time of death and like knowing that everything kind of I think it's hold it's grasping at stories. Mm. It's kind of this world we've created, this relationship, these narratives. And um I'm thinking about what what brightens the heart is Venerable Sariputta's story in terms of how like 
even when he was away from his teachers, he would bow and he would figure out what direction they were in and he would bow in their direction. And, there, and I'm thinking, I'm piecing all the pieces together. Like Ajahn Brahm didn't cry when he, his dad died. He was grateful for the time. And your teacher, uh, Ajahn Anand, he just recently said that Venerable Sariputta was foremost in gratitude. So is there something about gratitude that could help with this restlessness about contemplating the body and making it stable like earth? Thank you, Joseph. What I think I can speak to there is, so for those who don't know, this is a beautiful story. Venerable Sariputta, the foremost in wisdom, uh, a monk saw him bowing in a direction every morning and uh, went to the Buddha and complained because there was a traditional Brahmin practice of bowing in the directions and this monk thought that Venerable Sariputta was falling into superstition and bowing towards the sun or something like that. And the Buddha said, no, Venerable Sariputta is bowing in the direction of his, of, uh, the, his first teacher, basically, the first m monastic who inspired him. And that beautiful recollection of honoring our, our, the person who brought us to Dhamma. And that's beautiful. There's a sutta with a monk called Venerable Vakali, and he was on his deathbed, and the Buddha comes to him and says, how do you feel, Venerable Vakali? And Vakali says, I regret that I didn't see you more. I, I regret that I didn't get a chance to pay respects to you more. And the Buddha says, what do you care for this putrid body? One who sees the Dhamma sees me. If you are close to the Dhamma, you see me. One who sees me sees the Dhamma. And I think that's really the essence of it, is our refuge isn't in a certain teacher or bringing a certain storyline or expressing gratitude to a certain individual, although if we can do that, it's, it's great. But that sense of honoring the Dhamma in our lives and that greater force of life and nature um, and truth that's in our hearts if you pay respects to that, that's the refuge. And you don't have to worry about closure with that. I mean, that's why the Buddha recommended death contemplation is if you recollect you only have this breath, how grateful I am to be able to practice the Dhamma for this long. You honor and show gratitude for, for the Dhamma. And I think the, that's where the heart can come to rest. And I think it's beautiful to see everyone around us as sort of conduits of that truth. So rather than taking refuge in or trying to bring closure with a certain individual, no matter how meaningful they've been to you, recollecting that if you're honoring your duty to the Dhamma right now, pursuing truth, clarifying the heart, one who sees the Buddha sees the Dhamma, and one who sees the Dhamma sees the Buddha. And I think that does all alleviate the worry about death. There's closure right there if you look to it. Um, does that help at all, Joseph? Yes, thank you so much. Please forgive me for anything I've done with the three doors of body, speech, and mind. I forgive you, and you. I cannot think of anything you've done recently. <laughs> so. and, and in any previous lives, too, that I can't remember now, please forgive me. Sadhu, sadhu. Okay. Thanks, Joseph. Okay, we have a bit more longer as well. Um, Scott. Hello, Arjun. Hi. Uh, it's it's been a while. It's good to see you. Um, uh, I'd like to ask, um, in 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 reference to another talk, but in also reference to the talk today, um, you have a an amazing and beautiful ability to um, bring us the the Dhamma from the Suttas. In a recent talk, you referenced Maji Nikaya um, to all of the defilements and listed the um, the, the defilements to be abandoned by seeing and um uh it, you just it just came it just came very naturally and it was very very beautiful i was wondering how you how you acquired this this knowledge like did you go through a process and uh because it you 
you you do it very often that you bring us the Dhamma and it's from the suttas and it comes very naturally and it doesn't seem like you have to put much effort in to access this memory. So that's a question that's a question I'd like to say. And I'd also like to mention that um this ill will in the body, um, it manifests for me in the in the face and um I can feel that very um and that that's very that's very pragmatic. Um, I can I can notice I can notice the malevolence very clearly in the face mm. and and maybe other different parts of the body and it's very it's very helpful. Thank you, Scott. I think to address first a caveat I forgot to put about body contemplation is it should help with body image. Negative body image is comparing one's own body to other bodies and seeing other bodies as more beautiful, whereas body contemplation should lead to just seeing all these bodies as kind of these silly kind of clumsy like things that we kind of drag around and they're a bit strange and they're doing their best but they're they're not like that beautiful it's just sort of like you know and, and so it really should lead to a softening of self um negative self body image uh which i think is really important because that's such a thing it's such a thing especially for women i think and so uh, I don't think that maybe is what you're speaking to, but just that seems like an important point to bring up is it should soften that sense of comparison. Um, as to the suttas, yes, the one you're referencing is from last Saturday's talk. And just because I love that uh, quote so much, it's the Buddha talking about how we proliferate. And in Majjhima Nikaya 2, he says, one inappropriately attends to one's experience by thinking, was I in the past? Was I not in the past? How was I in the past? Uh, what was I in the past? Having been what, what will I be? Or one thinks about the future. Will I be in the future? Will I not be in the future? How will I be? Uh, having been what, what will I become? Or one is inwardly perplexed about the present. Am I? Am I not? How am I? What am I? Having been what, where will I go? And I just, these teachings are 2,500 years old, but they're so brilliant. He just nails us. And like, that's most of our thinking is those, those 15 roots. Um, so with memorizing Dhamma, th the monks in the Buddhist time did this all the time. Uh, and it's really worth doing if the wisdom in the suttas is the most, prof I think they're the most profound teachings that we've ever been given in, in history. I'm biased, but I, you know, I'm biased for a reason. Um, and if you... Basically, what I did is, is either make a practice of reading a sutta every, every day. Um, I'm a binger, so that didn't really work for me. So what I did is I just decided over the course of a few weeks to just stay up late um, and, and read through the suttas really as sort of in one go and then take notes. And then over the course of the subsequent years, I kept on reading through them and also memorized more the, the key parts. Um, there's a... If you type in Daily Sutta um, newsletter, you will you can subscribe to this great newsletter that gives you a sutta a day. It's curated by a monk we know. It's really good. Um, but I'd say, yeah, beginning to work through the suttas is really useful. On our website, under Ajahn Kovilo's writings at clearmountainmonastery.org, there's an article called How to Memorize Long Dhamma. And it goes into these methods called a memory palace, which is how you encode memory and um, I use that almost every day along with a flashcard app called Anki to review the suttas I care about and that's good for insights too when we have a kind of blaze of insight there's this conceit that we'll remember it but it's really good to keep a journal of the insights you have and feed those into and they're gone feed those into a flashcard app and then you have access to your insights over time and you get to review them again and again so it's practical, but it's useful. So that's how I do it. And Scott's gone. So let's wrap up. No, I'm still here. I'm still here. Oh, hey, Scott. I'm still here. Good. Okay. Never yeah. mind. That's, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. So yeah, go. Uh, I don't know if you've got much more time, but um, go for it. Uh, would you, uh, when, when we say all the defilements about um, seeing, so it, do you think that they're talking about seeing these? these thought patterns that arise in the mind. Do you think the Buddha is talking about that? Because that's how I, I see it. I see it arising in the mind. I see these 
these proliferations arising in the mind. Is it, would, would you say that that's yeah, the, approximate? Sort of. The, um, that's Majjhima Nikaya 2, all the defilements, and it's beautiful because he does lay out defilements you abandon just by seeing them with wisdom. So he yeah. lays these inappropriate ways of attending to experience, and then he says, or one uh, tends to experience appropriately, thinking this is dukkha, this is the cause of dukkha, this is the cessation of dukkha, this is the path to the cessation of dukkha. So how he says you attend appropriately and not getting up in, caught up in a thicket of views, a contortion of views, etc., is the Four Noble Truths. And that's okay. always appropriate. So seeing the suffering and the unnecessary effort in those proliferations.